articulating your perception and understanding of India's position with respect to Syria, Sri Lanka and Burma. I now request uh, Ambassador Abhyankar to give his remarks. And I would also request him, like, you know, once he finishes with his remarks, to, like, you know, initiate the dialogue with uh, Kenneth Roth and then also take over the Q&A <coughs> session. Thank you very much. <coughs> Mr. Roth, um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for a really excellent <coughs> expose of um, certainly three countries which are quite close to India in many different ways, but more importantly to point out a number of things which impinge directly on India's foreign policy and how it is made. Many years back, in fact, in 1970, when I was a young diplomat in Geneva, attending a conference on Palestine, it was the first conference that I ever attended on Palestine in Montreux. And there was a <coughs> professor from Israel, a Jewish professor, who told me that he had visited India. And remember, at that time in 1970, we had no relations with Israel at all. As diplomats, we could not even shake their hand. It was that, that was the situation. But he told me he had visited Bombay and uh, he said there's, I learned that there is an 11th commandment in India. So I said, what is that? He said, thou shalt not compulse. He said, I learned that beyond a point you can't make an Indian do anything. If he decides he doesn't want to do it, he's not going to do it. I'm saying this in the co larger context of how our foreign policy is made and how uh, we react to some of the reports that come from Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, Transparency International, you name it. There's a whole lot of them. But to understand why we react like that or why we do not react, because you did say a number of times that uh, sitting on the fence is not an option or being neutral is not an option. Let me very quickly, I think, spend a few minutes to just highlight how Indian foreign policy decision is made. And I'll give the example, not from the present, although it applies always at the, the decision-making process is more or less the same. Nevertheless, let me give you the example of 1948 when um, Israel came into being. India was on the UN um, Special Commission on Palestine and India gave a dissenting note to the recommendation of the Special Commission because our note said that what you should have are, is an autonomous area for the Arabs within Israel which would uh, enable a division not to take place or a partition not. That was basically the crux of our dissenting note. Um, why did we do that? In 1947, at the time of the partition of India, we had seen what happens when people are ripped asunder. Over a million people were killed in the Hindu-Muslim conflict in the exchange of populations that took place between India and Pakistan. We knew the trauma that the Indian Muslims faced and continued to face in 1948. So when Israel was created, we had a real problem. <clears throat> Nehru, who was, of course, the maker of our foreign policy, was very keen to accept, to recognize the state of Israel and have relations with them. <coughs> Maulana Azad, who was his uh, advisor and also a very important minister, told him that this may not be the right time to do this for the simple reason that it would not be taken correctly by the Indian Muslim community, the Muslims who had stayed behind in India, who were more numerous than actually the Muslims who went to Pakistan. So um, we were in a dilemma as to what to do. There was another um, dynamic that was operating at that time. One was, I mean, that was that the Congress party, which had won the elections, had decided that if India had to remain united, if 
the only way it could be done was to have a secular society and secular in the sense of equal respect for all religions and there being no state religion, no financial assistance to any religion. And that was the basis of the plural secular society that the leaders of the independence movement decided that that was the only way to keep this country together. In contraposition to that, you had the Hindu Mahasabha and Savarkar, who was a leader of that, who were very keen to have a Hindu majority state. Democracy nevertheless, both of them, but which would have, which would be a majoritarian democracy, which is what Israel was. So that dynamic was also playing out apart from the dynamic of the partition. In the end, we decided that we would recognize the state of Israel since it existed. There's nothing we could do. But we would have no relations whatsoever with Israel. And that situation continued from 1947 all the way to 1992. A lot of effort was made during these years, but I'm just giving you the broad. So what is it that this shows? That a lot of the times when we take a decision, it is normally to look for the middle ground on a situation that faces us. And at the same time, to, uh, that a lot of churning goes on. It may not come out in the open, but it does happen. So that's just to say that um, whenever we react, we may or we do not react, be sure that it has been very closely examined from different points of view. And we try to see how best to uh, put it across so that without any of this coming out. And that having been said, um, let me uh, also take a more general point you also made about India and China as ideas. Now, of course, um, they are different ideas. I mean, a secular country which has this amount of freedom, I don't think that we will uh, ever see the kind of thing that happens in China. You mentioned about the very little uh, opportunity for a corrupt official, oh, if, if that's what you mentioned, that if somebody is caught with some making a lot of money in China, there seem to be, to me, to be an enormous amount of opportunity for these officials. Recently, 21 Indian, young Indian diamond mer merchants were hauled, hauled in and they've been in Chinese jail. They've just been released um, for two years. In a business in diamonds, which is entirely done in cash and which is entirely done by smuggling in uh, diamonds from Hong Kong for the simple reason that the VAT there is some 22%. And most of the diamond merchants there, a, a lot of them are wives of the nomenclatura and of the leadership there. And secondly, why is this, are these, is, are these diamonds and whatever jewelry they are put into bought in cash for the simple reason that this is where all the cash goes. So, the, I mean, but have, on, at that same time, I think, um, I don't see that India and China as ideas would ever meet. We tried it. We had two years of emergency and it didn't work. If we tried to have an emergency here, again, I doubt even if that emergency will succeed the way India has moved forward. Coming now to quickly to the th three countries that you mentioned. Syria, of course, uh, I'm very happy when you say that uh, you do look at both sides of the situation. Unfortunately, if you look at all the reports coming out on Syria, they are rather one-sided. They only talk of the protesters who are in any case, they also talk of arming the protesters, which means they are bringing in, uh, the, there's been a very heavy militarization in Syria in the last few months. I was actually invited by the Syrian government in August, which was uh, when the first presidential statement came out. And um, luckily, I was able to meet a lot of my old friends, having been ambassador there, but 15 years ago. But nevertheless, I have friends there. And, and I, at that time, established that uh, certainly about 60 to 65 percent of the population was definitely still in August with Assad. Situation may have, I'm sure situation has changed now and I would probably not having, uh, well, from the reports I would say that I would maybe about 50 or 45 percent may still be with him, but I don't know where it will go. He has announced an election on the 7th of May 
I think the Anand mission should actually do its best to see and hold him to ho having an election. Now, of course, we will say that it's a sham election, it's going to be a sham election. Well, so was Karzai's election in 2009 in Afghanistan. I mean, it was clearly proved that lots of money changed hands, votes were rigged. But anyway, he's there and we need him, so we need to have him there. And it's the same thing goes as far as Myanmar is concerned. So elections will always be criticized as being sham. Even in India, somebody will say that something is probably not on all fours. It's going to happen. But we have to find a way to deal with this situation in Syria for the simple reason that while there is no doubt that the Syrian government has been totally high-handed and has ridden roughshod over the people. The question is, removing them in a Libyan-style fashion is not going to help anyone. Look at what has happened today to, for example, Israel's borders. The only quiet border that Israel has today is with Syria, because the border with Palestine, the border uh, with, I mean, the Gaza and Ramallah, the Egyptians have removed the restrictions that Mubarak had and they have allowed movement. So things are becoming far more active in that sense. But more importantly, it is still the only country which is not pushing a particularly religious agenda. Unfortunately, the protests have got mixed up with two things. One is the anti-Iran, pro-Sunni agenda of the Saudis, which has coalesced with the anti-Iran, pro-democracy agenda of the West. And naturally, nobody wants to be dictated about what kind of democracy they want. So I believe that uh, there may be some wisdom in trying to get um, Kofi Annan's mission to succeed in terms of at least having an election. Now the question is, take the uh, case of Egypt and take the case of Syria or take the case of Tunisia and take the case of Syria. There you had elections first and now they are debating about a constitutional body. In Egypt, they have decided to set up a 100-member body in which 50% of the quota is with the uh, Islam Muslim Brotherhood and the Al-Nur. The rest of them will be selected. Here you have the reverse. You had a constitution referendum first and then you are going to have elections. Now, everything is flawed. Nothing is going to be perfect at this point in state, at time in any of these countries. But the, what we would like to see is that this moves forward in a peaceful and a more cooperative way. And that is why at the Human Rights Council, we have been quite uh, active in condemning uh, Syrian violence uh, against its own people because this is something that we just cannot understand here in India. Uh, we also cannot understand the disproportionate level of violence that has been perpetrated on them, um, which is against any canons of uh, justice and all that. But um, this is just a general point. We are fully there as far as seeing that the Syrian government and the people benefit and come out of this in one piece and that the country doesn't fracture. That is our danger. Um, on Sri Lanka, I've had a long association with Sri Lanka. I was Deputy High Commissioner there when this whole business started in 1983. One of my, my unforgettable days is 23rd of July, 1983, when actually I was picking up dead bodies on, the, on Gaul Road. And uh, we had, that's the first time that anti-Tamil riots in Sri Lanka also became anti-Indian. Now, I have worked out that generally there is an equation or a triangulation between the government of Tamil Nadu, the government of India, and the government of Sri Lanka. Whenever the government of India and the government of uh, Tamil Nadu think alike, the Sri Lanka government is in trouble. Whenever the government of Sri Lanka and the government of India think alike, the government of Tamil Nadu is in trouble. We are in that situation just now. And, th and that is how the DMK was able to push the government to change its line on Sri Lanka. Frankly, I'm glad that they have done it because in, ever since the <clears throat> virtual decimation of the LTTE, um, government of India has more or less kept uh, hands off 
policy vis-a-vis -vis Sri Lanka. Although we have been in the past great champions of, of, a, of trying to ensure Tamil rights within a united Sri Lanka. But we have just stopped all that for whatever reason best known to people who are making policy. But uh, it is certainly not to uh, the benefit of the Tamil community, which is around 15 or 20 million now, uh, sorry, five or seven million, um, because for the simple reason that after the decimation of the LTTE, there is really no one who speaks for Tamil rights. And the government of Sri Lanka has been taking the position of a victor that uh, take what we give you. Basically, that's the line. And a lot of the Tamil parties have been co-opted into provincial governments and so on. And this has, naturally, it's not the best deal. How can it be the best deal? It reminds me a lot of the kind of situation that happened after the First World War when at the Treaty, I think, of Versailles, when the Americans and the British were very keen that, that while conditions should be imposed on Germany and, and reparations. It was France which took the lead in ensuring that the German nose should be ground in the dust and that led to the Second World War. This is the kind of uh, rhetoric that I get from the government and, and this is the real problem because in Sri Lanka, the, whenever the situation has reached a point where you could actually have some sensible arrangement for the Tamils without disrupting the unity of Sri Lanka. It has always been the party, the Sinhala party not in power, which has ensured to f filibustering it, including the Buddhist Sangha. So this has been the ambient sort of condition within which now you have this business of looking at the thing as a victor. And uh, whatever we can do, and I, I frankly hope that this change of the vote is not a flash in the pan, but that it will actually lead to a genuine look at how we should be handling the whole question of Sri Lanka. Because it's next to us. And um, again, I'll tell you, sorry, I hope you give me a few minutes. Uh, it's um, exactly the parallel situation to Cyprus, where I was High Commissioner, and as Ambassador in Turkey as well, so I know both sides there. It's really the question that the Tamil, on the one hand, the Tamils feel that, you know, we may be 5 million or 7 million here in Sri Lanka, but we got 55 million sitting be behind us who are only 20 kilometers away or 28 kilometers away. Exactly the same story with the Turkish Cypriots and Turkey and the Turks. Whereas the uh, Sinhalas feel, you know, we are, where are we going to go? We can't go in the sea. So it has, it has a classic case of a situation where there is a polarization essentially of only two communities, which are both linguistic, religious, but not ethnic. Uh, but here you have a majority community which has a minority complex and a minority community which has a majority complex. And that is the whole problem in Sri Lanka. Coming to Myanmar, uh, it is true that uh, we have been, I mean, our policy till 1992 or 93, or maybe in 94, towards uh, Myanmar was to promote democracy, was to put all our eggs in the basket of uh, supporting Aung San Suu Kyi and the democracy movement there. We actually did find that this was affecting us in terms of the insurgent movements that are there in every state in, north, in the northeast of India. They were getting succor, they were getting sanctuary, and they were getting arms and ammunition. This is a fact. And we have had um, no end of trouble uh, on that score in getting those states into the Indian mainstream thanks to all these movements. And that was the reason why in 1990, around by 96, we had changed our position to start dealing with the colonels, I mean the army, because we said, unless we do that, we're not going to be able to deal with this. And in fact, the situation is much better. The situation also became better once uh, the ASEAN had accepted Myanmar and India became a summit level partner of um, the ASEAN from 2002. Uh, and then we decided that we will continue this policy 
while supporting democracy, not to be overtly so, and um, to s ensure that our basic self-interest and security was assured. We are very happy with what has happened, even though, as I said again, it's all fla flawed, the election is a sham, but at least there is a movement. You may be right that the sanctions have uh, had a major role to pay, play in this, and I'm sure they have had. But here, actually, on, for, as far as the international community is concerned, is a question of deciding at what point will it become, will the law of diminishing returns start applying? Because beyond a point, sanction, the country will say, you know, you can't extract so much out of us. We'll have to see and gauge exactly what is the correct level when sanctions will start having a counterproductive effect. Parallel case is of Turkey, which very wisely in the last 10 years used all the, all the European Union's country in order to become a member to change the entire system in Turkey. And now that they've done it, they don't, they have as little interest in becoming part of Europe as Europe has in having them. But they have used it and leveraged it very cleverly. We have to see how that kind of a situation can be promoted as far as uh, public oversight of foreign policy decisions. In fact, it started happening, the first time it happened was actually when I was uh, <coughs> secretary in Delhi de and dealing really with Iraq and uh, when we were under tremendous pressure from President Bush and uh, Mr. Cheney and Mr. Rumsfeld to send 15,000 tr Indian troops for helping with the policing and with the security of the north of Iraq. I made an incognito visit there to Iraq at that time, unknown to anyone, just to go and see. I met Talabani, I met Barzani, I met the whole lot of them. Uh, while, they, of course, there was a great uh, respect for Indian, uh, Indian troops who have fought there for long. Uh, I came back and I said, there's no way that we should be going there. Uh, because uh, on the one hand, of course, the reasons were very important that we would not be getting anything out of it. But And the one simple question that Prime Minister Vajpayee asked, to, asked me was, what will I tell the people if even one Indian soldier dies? There you are. But that was the first time that an international or a foreign policy issue came out on the streets of India. There were demonstrations in India. There were in Delhi. In Lucknow, all over the place, there were demonstrations against the U.S. invasion of Iraq until a point was reached in the parliament where the prime minister had to call an inter-party uh, inter meeting, all-party meeting of the leaders to decide what to do. What was the position that the parliament was going to take on the question of, uh, of whatever we may or may not do in Iraq? And uh, it's, it so happened that on the 8th of April, uh, 8th of March, sorry, uh, no, 8th of April, 2003, uh, the, the all-party meeting decided that we would, uh, they would, the parliament would pass a resolution that India will, whatever India does will be under UN auspices only and under no other. And in a way, it was a very pyrrhic victory because that was the day Baghdad fell to US troops. So, uh, public oversight since then has taken uh, slowly, it is a lot of issues are coming out in the public, and I think you're right that the more it comes out, firstly, people became, become aware of this, people become aware of what kind of uh, factors, but it can also play badly. For example, we have recently been having a huge amount of media exposure to the two little kids who, uh, in Norway, who have uh, um, had to be put under foster care because it was assumed that the parents were mistreating them and the government issued six statements in the last two months about this. It now turns out that there were marital problems between the couple which were either known and not expressed and it turns out that it is really a kind of situation which I have as Consul General in San Francisco come across with a number of South Asian families if not other families. So now we've decided to cease and desist for the time being on the whole thing. So of course it can also go wrong, ex excessive media exposure. And there are certain things that it is just not possible to expose. But that having been said, I support you entirely in saying that there should be uh, greater foreign policy 
transparency in terms of public debate on issues that concern the country. That having been said, let me... Uh, not so much about all these countries, but you did mention that uh, India should be a little more proactive in terms of promoting the uh, observance of human rights outside India. Mm -hmm. um, we also get similar um, suggestions and proposals. We also get similar suggestions and proposals that India should uh, do more to promote democracy abroad, outside India being an old democracy. Now, the way I've been able to understand our position is that uh, it's like Hinduism. I mean, either you're born Hindu or you're not, you can't be, be converted. There's no evangelization. So that's the same thing as far as our view on democracy and human rights is concerned, that we are, if you are interested, we are more than happy to help. But we are not going to go out promoting it. I don't see us, frankly, doing this. But I quite see that the reverse of it which is that implementation of human rights in India could be far, far better. There is no question of it. Um, part of it is because uh, our implementation of the laws that we have are not as, is not effective. And secondly, maybe we need to also align our laws to some of the UN conventions. So I am really intrigued about how one can leverage some of the ideas that come from you, uh, you know, you, uh, Human Rights Watch and other such agencies in a positive way to uh, help the situation in India, to leverage it. I, my example is when I was ambassador to the EU, we were under, have been un, always under strong pressure to uh, have a panel, a bilateral panel on discussion of human rights in India. And we have resisted it, but we did agree to having a panel in 2004. I saw the letter that your executive director wrote to the president of the commission uh, just before the last India-EU summit about having mainstreaming basically human rights discussion. So really the question is how can we leverage some of these things both for internally and externally? Okay, well I mean first of all, <clears throat> I, don't think, um, I don't think the analogy to religion is the right one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are Yes, you're born Hindu or Muslim or what have you. Um, and indeed, you can't say one's better than the other. They're just different religions, and, and you are what you are. Yeah. Um, but rights and democracy are different, because I think everybody wants their rights respected. Um, it's almost in the nature of many governments to try to prevent that, because if they allowed rights to be respected, they would lose power. And so there is a... Um, you're not sitting here, you're not converting people. You know, you're not saying, aha, you know, you're, you're a dictatorship, but I want to convert you through some kind of religious experience to become a democracy. It's not like that. Instead, you're saying, you know, the people here in India, they want their rights respect and they want democracy and, and they have a democracy here. Um, why are the people in your country any different? And when you're talking to the dictator, you know, why, why do you think your people don't want their rights respected? And of course, there's, there's no good answer to that. You know, so that's why I think that there is a role, because if you believe that everybody's rights should be respected, then um, you're not converting the dictator, you're pressuring them to respect those rights. And that's a very important role to play, particularly for a you know, government that has the influence that can make a difference the way India does. Um, now you ask, you know, how, how do you leverage it here? I mean, I think that the, <clears throat> you know, first, I don't think India needs international pressure to respect rights. I mean, there, is, there are strong domestic constituencies that are pushing in that direction. But there are, um, just to give one example, at the Human Rights Council, I mean, as you know, there is a procedure where every five years, every member of every state, actually not even just members of the council, but every state reports to the council about their human rights record. And then governments question it. And um, this, this you know, so-called periodic review 
is a good opportunity because um, India, if they're being honest, will say, well, yes, we do have problems with this or we have problems with that. And they'll be questioned about it and it's an opportunity to use that public forum to get commitments for the government about how it's going to improve respect for rights. So this periodic review is a, um, I think, a, you know, a good tool that domestic groups can then use to say, you know, aha, you said, you know, Mr. Prime Minister, you said in Geneva that the following things would happen. Now we're going to hold you to your promise. Well, yes. Um, take the case of uh, which we constantly get pilloried, two of them. One is the death penalty in India, and the second is um, child labor. Now, we have, um, on both issues, tried to explain that death penalty, of course, is a question of either having it or not having it. Even the United <coughs> States has not, some states do have. Um, in a country of 1.3 billion, certain deterrence is required. But uh, on child labor, what we have tried to, for example, explain to the European Union, that what we want to do is go trade by trade and see how it can be eliminated, rather than putting a blanket ban. Because that's the way it can be done. Um, it is not possible to make a law and say, and although there is a law, and still believe that this is going to be observed. It's not. So you have to go trade by trade and see how you can give, because it also links up to the issue of alternative incomes for these families or alternative employment. So there are a whole lot of practical issues which is why it becomes kind of difficult to respond in a categoric way to some of these things. But um, I think that um, the universal uh, review that the Human Rights Council <coughs> has is fine. There you will actually hear what, whatever the countries put in, they'll put in there because it's a regular thing. But here as going beyond the, UN, the universal that whether there is a possibility of actually having a bilateral way in which some of these ideas can be leveraged to actually see, okay, this is what you want to do. How do you start doing it? How do you start improving the implementation? I mean, that kind of a thing. What are the, and that can be very helpful because for example, it, uh, the child labor thing, I think it was suggested, I don't know by whom, but that start doing trade by trade, seeing that there is observance so that you, slowly reach the end of the point, I mean, whatever it is. Well, I think that the, um, I mean, you're right on something like child labor. Nobody thinks that the way to stop child labor is by just passing a law. Um, because you do have to worry about, um, you know, you don't want the kids just ending up on the street. You want them ending up in school. Um, you know, families put their children into labor because they're desperate, and so you need to find ways to provide better incomes for the family. And so I think people recognize the complexity of it. And if, if you know, India were to be answering questions about child labor at the Human Rights Council under a universal periodic review, I think the appropriate answer would be to say, this is our strategy. You know, not that we're going to end it tomorrow necessarily, but that you know, this is our, our, our strategy for eradicating it as quickly as possible, recognizing that it's a complex social issue. And it's, it's not you know, just an on-off switch. We have to take various steps. Um, I mean, the other thing that's worth noting is that it's not just the UN where this dialogue can happen. I mean, Human Rights Watch engages in dialogue all the time with the government, and, and often quite productively around a range of issues. And so I think that that is, when human rights work is effective, governments engage in this kind of dialogue and make changes on the basis of it. And that's always the preferred route. We, you know, as a human rights group, we would like to avoid having to go to the public pressure route. It's best for us if we can do a study, see a problem, talk to the government, and discuss solutions. And, and frankly, we've been able to do that with the Indian government in a number of cases. I'll now uh, call for questions uh, from the floor. Could you introduce yourself before you? So I'm advocate Shreya, so practicing in Bombay. I work with expertise in constitutional and criminal law. At the outset, I'm extremely delighted by your august presence. And I was extremely intrigued and I found I don't need a magnifier, I need a silencer. <laughs> <laughs> To do it for the others. Yeah, I'm extre your talk was extremely <laughs> thought-provoking and informative. So there are certain trivial issues that we raise, we make a UN cry about human rights. For instance, a celebrity is frisked at US airport and the external affairs ministry makes a UN cry about <coughs> it. And there are certain significant issues, like for instance, a terror attack happens 
at a consulate and like this gentleman talked about death penalty now pre 1973 the statute book stated categorically that you have to give special reasons for not giving death penalty now post 1973 india being signatory to certain international con convention said death penalty ought to be given in rarest of rare gravest of grave reasons india has of late been signif signatories to one number of conventions and n number of uh, treaties and all that now sir of late you must have heard of certain italian nationals who have been alleged of killing certain fishermen now the maoists and the ultra leftists so called naxalites have kidnapped two italians and the government wants to negotiate with them now the fact of the matter is these are we follow an adversarial system of justice where the victims have no say we talk of presumption of innocence fair trial right against double jeopardy presumption of innocence so under these circumstances this does have a bearing on foreign policy because the consulate intervenes the other country tries to put a pressure under these circumstances there is a conflict of interest and the balance of convenience in whose whose favor so in your opinion sir how should the government diplomatically tactfully and preserving the national keeping in mind the supreme national interest how should it deal with such a situation right, well let me uh, before i answer your question can i just make a quick announcement which is um i was just given word that the um the resolution in geneva on sri lanka passed um by by a large margin there were 24 votes in favor of the resolution 15 against and eight abstentions so there actually were more yes votes than the noes and the abstentions combined um so that's a that's a big victory and and india clearly played a a major role in that okay. um now in response to your question um there always are special interests being pled um and i think it's you know it's important for governments to try to be principled in in difficult cases and to you know to apply the law even handedly across the board in the case like the death penalty i mean my preference is you never apply it but if you're going to have the death penalty you sure certainly should use it you know only as you indicated in the most severe cases um you should make sure that um uh, that due process is scrupulously respected in those cases you know when when people are railroaded to justice with with um you know questionable procedures those are the last circumstances where the death penalty should be applied um i think we all um recognize that you know one of the unfairnesses about the death penalty is that if you are um if you have powerful friends whether it's you know your your country or or just you know your wealthy person or what have you you're much less likely to get the death penalty and that's one of the good reasons why we shouldn't have the death penalty because you know no no country executes every murderer um they always have to choose you know because it would just be too many executions and nobody would tolerate that so they've got to pick and choose and the way it tends to come out is that the poor and unfortunate people are the ones who are executed among the murderers and so i think you know the the the, <clears throat> the cases you cite are just another example for why we should not have the death penalty Yes, please, uh, ma'am. Uh, yes, yes, you. Yeah. and other issues uh, one of the reasons why perhaps it's looked upon as an issue of the north and the south is we rarely look at right by human rights violations which are regarding economic and social rights for example even in sri lanka with the millions were systematically being starved 
I don't think it had the same implication it had when people were being killed. I mean, I'm not justifying the killing. It's, it's, I mean, especially when you see some of these videos, they're absolutely disturbing. But if Human Rights Watch also reacted to the fact that there is a major violation when people don't get access to food, and perhaps it, it's a systematic starvation that was going on, then probably some of these charges would be definitely, you know, perhaps at least muted, if not completely done away with. And similarly, when one is talking about capital punishment, when European Union wants to be present when there is a capital punishment in India, it would be extremely brilliant if they also decided to be present when there's a capital punishment in the US. Mm -hmm. And which again would perhaps negate the argument about, you know, it becoming a North versus South issue. And uh, the other also is when we're talking about a principle stand, I'm not sure what kind of principle stand India can take, considering the fact that what are we doing with the protesters in Kudankulam? We are actually treating them worse than what perhaps uh, criminals are being treated. So if countries have to take a principle stand, they need to introspect first. And a lot of human rights violations in India today are escalating rather than coming down. So if Human Rights Watch has such a view that India should be playing an important role, and I do think we should, the question is, if we don't address the problems within, are we going to be in a position to deal with it? And uh, finally, the question is, if you're looking at Sri Lanka, the Sri Lankan situation is so complicated. Because yes, India today is voting with the resolution, but we were also one of the causes of the problems there. I mean, the way in which the Indian uh, armed forces reacted there or worked there, and also the fact it's an open secret, that we were definitely training the LTT at one stage. So how are we going to actually take a principle stand given the fact that there's so much of hypocrisy built into it? But one thing I would definitely appreciate is if Human Rights Watch is going to be more active in India. I think a lot of us would definitely be very appreciative of it. Thank you. So that was not a question. It was just a comment. Uh, you know, um, let me just respond. Yeah. <coughs> Let me, let me just wrap it um, yeah. yeah, I mean, first of all, in terms of, um, <clears throat> on the economic, social, cultural rights issue, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I mean, first of all, Human Rights Watch does a lot of work on economic, social, and cultural rights. And, you know, in India, we've looked at um, maternal mortality, we've looked at the right to, to pain relief. Um, we're, I mean, these are major issues for us. And so we are, um, and I agree with you that it's important to look at both. Um, I don't, um, in a second, in terms of you know the fact that there are human rights violations in India, does that preclude promoting human rights around the world? No, I don't think it does. Um, you know, obviously, we, it's always important to try to clean up your act at home. But if we waited for everybody to have a perfect human rights record at home before ever promoting human rights abroad, there would be no international human rights movement. And and in fact, I, you know, every government has its imperfections. But I find that when when somebody is criticized by saying, oh, but you have a human rights problem at home, that doesn't go very far. You know, the discussion should be about what are they being criticized for and, you know, where are they falling short. So I would, you know, yes, India should clean up its act, but it should also be promoting human rights around the world. And it doesn't have to wait till perfection at home before playing the broader role. Um, you know, finally on the, um, I agree with you, like, we, you know, we've pushed the European Union to speak out against U.S. abuses. Um, we did that around the torture, we do that around the death penalty. You know, we're regularly asking them to bring up human rights issues in their bilateral uh, dialogues with the United States. And that's something I, I agree should, should happen more often. You know, finally, on, um, on Sri Lanka, you know, I, yes, India at times may have supported the LTT, but you know, India didn't order the indiscriminate shelling and killing of 40,000 people. You know, so the fact that there may have been some complicity in the distant past has nothing to do really with these war crimes that were committed at the end of the conflict. And so India should be speaking out about that as it did today um, in, in Geneva to try to get those resolved. Thank you. Okay, now it's on. Uh, Samir Kapati with Gateway House, foreign policy think tank here. Um, I'm Dr. Sorry, Mr. Roth, your line of reasoning with the case in Syria, um, how India did not vote along 
or voted alongside Russia and China at the UN Security Council stage, Assad saw that as support, more people were killed. If you use that for now, so if India doesn't go along with the sanctions against Iran and some sort of issue happens where Israel attacks um, Iran and there's a military strike and there are human rights violations, are you going to blame India then as well? So when do you stop the dominoes from falling? Because India becomes more and more important, as you say. You know, how, how much is it going to be to blame if it doesn't take an active involvement in what you see fit? Thank you. Yeah, I, I got to say, I'm, in Syria, I'm not talking about you know, attenuated causal connections. I'm talking about a very direct result. Um, you know, at a point where India was, chose not to put pressure on Assad, Assad saw that as an endorsement. You know, the only issue on the table was the killing happening right then and there. And at that moment, India decided to be neutral. Um, you know, it doesn't take any long chain of causation to figure out that Assad's going to take that as an endorsement. And he did. That's what happened. So that's why I'm happy that India has now, you know, gotten tougher. Because it's only by getting tough with Assad and putting pressure on him that this killing is going to end. Uh, excuse me, I think... Uh, There's a question from really? this gentleman, Parik <coughs> Sava. Um, I'm translating it from Hindi to English for him. So he has two questions. So uh, there was an issue of uh, the Hindus from Kashmir who uh, voluntarily went out of Kashmir or were ousted from Kashmir because of conflict in that region. <coughs> so uh, the, uh, the local Kashmiri government or the Indian government, uh, he says, has not done enough for them. Is Human Rights Watch going to get involved in this or, uh, you know, do more research into this? Second part of the question is the Hindus in Pakistan. Uh, uh, he says that they, they are forcibly being converted into uh, Islam, which is another religion, uh, without their consent. And uh, is Human Rights Watch uh, going to take any stance on this or work for them? Yeah. Well, I mean, in, in Kashmir, we've done extensive work on Kashmir and we'll continue to do extensive work on Kashmir. You know, as issues come up, we'll address them. We, as a matter of principle, report on both sides in Kashmir. Um, we will always do that. Um, we don't take political sides there. We're not for a particular political solution. Our aim is simply to, you know, uphold the rights of all people in Kashmir, wherever they're threatened from. And so we'll continue with that. Um, in terms, I have to say, I, I'm not familiar with the allegation that Hindus are facing forcible conversion in Pakistan. If that's a systematic problem, we'd certainly look at it. And we've been very active, for example, on things like the misuse of the blasphemy laws in Pakistan, which are used principally to persecute Christians there. Um, but it's, um, so, you know, this kind of religious strife is something we address in Pakistan. I wasn't aware of the particular Hindu conversion thing, but I'd like to learn more about it. Sir, my name is Arbi Purohit. I just want to ask one question, that why you want to force others to tow your line by sanctions and other sort of materials? Can't you have an amenable handle other than this? That when you force, in, in a way, it is a good thing for India when you say supercomputers will not be given, we made our own. I think this type of sanctions definitely help other countries. I don't think it makes any uh, sense in escalating these sanctions and trying to tow others your line, especially in the case of the Iran, when the India's interests are there. <coughs> I do not know how America and other countries are using this handle, the sanctions. I am very much uh, this thing. Don't you think it is against human rights? Well, first of all, I should be clear. Human Rights Watch is not advocating sanctions in the case of Iran. Um, that's, you know, so, so Iran has now come up twice. Um, you know, that is a a nuclear question, a, you know, a strategic question. It's not a human rights question. So we're, we're not, we don't take a position on that. Um, but if you look at the issue of sanctions for human rights, um, which is something that we do take a position of in, in the case of Syria, or in the case of Myanmar, we, we did with Libya, um, you know, when, you, when a government is committing very serious violations, so it's not just kind of run-of-the-mill violations, but when it's engaged in large-scale killing, for example, um, the aim then is to increase the pressure on the government to stop. And there are different ways to do that. You know, at first you can try to shame the government in the press. That may work. <clears throat> but if it resists, you know, you've got to build up the pressure. Um, if, if the crimes are being committed, we try to bring in the International Criminal Court. 
Um, in extreme cases, some people say military intervention, but you know, the logical next step, frankly, after condemnation is sanctions because it increases the economic cost of, of the killing. Um, you know, governments commit human rights violations because they think there's a rational reason to do it. Um, they feel it's a way of suppressing the opposition or, or you know, getting rid of, of some kind of threat. And so the only way to get that to stop, because they see an advantage to it, they're sitting there, they're doing a cost-benefit analysis. If they think the benefits are up here from killing people, you've got to increase the cost. And the logical way to increase the cost is through sanctions. Now, when I say sanctions, I don't mean broad you know, embargoes of trade or starvation of the people or anything like that. We advocate targeted sanctions. We advocate you know, freezing the assets of the people who are doing the killing. We f favor banning the people who are doing the killing from traveling. We favor prosecuting the people who are doing the killing. So these are not sanctions that are aimed at the broad public. They are aimed at the people who are doing the killing. And if you don't, I mean, tell me a better way to do it. But if that's a good way to raise the cost for those people. So when they do the cost-benefit analysis, they suddenly see the killing is too expensive. It's too costly. And that's one way to get them to stop. Hello, sir. I think uh, yeah. the young lady there. My name is Yogesh. Afterwards, I think you give the lady in front of you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Komal from Asia Society. Mm -hmm. Uh, you were speaking uh, earlier about comparative <coughs> development in India and China and that India is more transparent, more accountable, and completely agree with you. But I personally find it hard to argue against people who take the stand that you know, the e economic model of China will see people better off in the long run. And you know, people say, what good are the human rights of the Indian farmer who's so poor that he kills himself? And Economists like Atul Kohli who look at uh, countries like South Korea and say countries with short periods of authoritarian rule actually see people better off in the long run in terms of GDP per capita. So how do you argue against uh, those stances and do you have suggestions of um, books to read or, or facts or places to go to for statistics to counter these arguments? Mm -hmm. Well, let me, let me just offer sort of, you know, two observations there. I mean, first of all, that with respect to China itself, I think it's important to look at not simply GDP, but to look at how individuals are affected. And Human Rights Watch has actually done a few studies. I'll give you one example. We looked at um, an area where, because of the economic development, there was massive pollution of, of the waterways, the lakes in that area. And lead was being dumped in the water. Children were drinking that water you know, getting permanently brain damaged from drinking this water. And the government just covered it up. You know, there would be, the, the, the parents would bring their children to the hospital, they would be tested for lead, the test would be, you know, <laughs> way high, and the government would suppress it, tell the parents there was nothing wrong with the kid. Um, and that is a great example of how, when you have an unaccountable authoritarian system, people are sort of chewed up and spit out when they're inconvenient. And, and it it's, it's illustri illustrates <clears throat> why it's not enough <clears throat> to simply look at GDP, you have to look at how are individuals affected. And when you have an unaccountable government, individuals often are worse off rather than better off. And the aim should be for everybody to benefit fairly from economic growth. I think an accountable system like India's is more likely to produce that than a repressive one like, like China's. The other thing that's worth noting is that, you know, for various reasons, the Chinese leadership has made some decent decisions, at least in terms of how to build the economy as a whole. But when you have unaccountable governments, they are notoriously corrupt. I mean, even China is, is greatly infected by corruption at this stage, and that may well be <clears throat> their, their downfall in some respects. But there are many, many governments that have been unaccountable dictatorships where the corruption has completely gotten in the way of any economic development. And there are far more unsuccessful dictatorships when it comes to economic development than there are successful ones. You know, if you had to bet, you know, if you just, you know, we're going to be plopped down in some country, um, and you had to decide, you know, all right, you know, all I can decide is do I going to have an, am I going to have an unaccountable government or an accountable government in terms of my economic well-being? You'd be out of your mind to want the unaccountable government, you know, because for every China, there are going to be many, many more where the corruption completely undermines all economic prospects. So I think it's worth just, you know, putting it in the broader picture because the people who talk about the China model are the dictators of the world who like to say, you know, oh yeah, you know, I, I don't need to have a democracy here. I don't need to allow the opposition. I can stay, you know, be president for life because they did it in China. 
Um, and that's a recipe for economic disaster. Thank you. So one um, question. Uh, my, I'm, my name is Yogesh. I'm from DNA, the newspaper. Uh, basically, you know, you just told, told her the Myanmarese example of how 40% FDI in Myanmar comes from China and only 2% from Ch India. Um, there was always this fear when India supported this resolution, which you just told us about the results, uh, that, you know, it would just push Sri Lanka into the Chinese arms. And that is, it is already, we, we know that they're helping them build, a, they help them build a naval base and, and there's so, so much that is happening between Sri Lanka and China. So this encircling of India will further get strengthened if we do this. So how do we reconcile both these things on one way to be, you know, monitor what is happening in the neighborhood in terms of human rights and also ensure that your geostrategic interests do not get harmed? Yeah. Well, well, let me respond in two ways. I mean, first of all, if, you know, India and China clearly are competing. Um, India will never win that competition if it tries to be a better dictatorship than China. India's just going to lose that. You know, and so if India is going to win the competition, it should win it by doing what it's good at, which is by building on its democratic values. Um, and I think that it, the, in the long term, that's in India's interest. Um, take, take Myanmar today. Um, you know, is, if India had a, you know, a long track record of supporting the military dictatorship, is that going to endear it to the Burmese people who are going to be taking over the country? You know, I mean, I think it's very much in India's interest to be seen as supporting the people rather than the military dictatorship. You know, similarly in Sri Lanka, there happens to be a fairly brutal government in place right now. I don't see why India would want to align itself with that kind of brutality. How is that in India's long-term interest? And yes, there may be short-term ramifications because, you know, a brutal dictatorship is going to, you know, turn its back on people who don't want to close their eyes to that brutality. But that's not what India should do. It should take the long perspective and stand with, you know, all the people of Sri Lanka, including its Tamil minority, and stand for the basic proposition that it's wrong to slaughter 40,000 people, that that is not the way to, to end a war. You know, it's got to be in India's interest to stand for that kind of principle. Thank you very much. I, it's been a pleasure having you here and talking on a large range of issues. And we're all going away greatly enlightened by your views and your ideas. And of course, this is an ongoing struggle. It's not going, it doesn't end by one talk or one visit. We hope you'll come again. Well, no, I'd be delighted. Thank you very much for your interest. It's been a pleasure being with you.